Welcome back to the Resourceful Agent Radio Show. I'm your host, Andy Silvius, and today's guest is a mechanical engineer, multifamily fund manager, and founder of Vestus Capital. Flint Jameson, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So uh, before we get started, where should people go to find your content or get in touch with you? Uh, so many places. Uh, I'm really active on LinkedIn, so LinkedIn forward slash Flint Jamison. You can find me putting helpful content out there. Um, otherwise, go straight to vestuscapital.com, B-E-S-T-U-S capital.com. Perfect. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well for everyone listening. So on today's episode, I want to discuss your experiences in uh, investing in real estate and why you've moved more towards commercial family real estate. Uh, but first, I want to go over your background and uh, find out a little bit, you know, where are you from? Yeah, I'm in Denver, Colorado. I grew up here. I did a stint out in Seattle for 10 years as a, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer and I was in the aerospace industry. So I worked at Boeing. I designed 787 for 10 years. Um, I'm still in my W-2, to be honest. And I uh, got into real estate in 2018. Basically what it is, is I, I want to get to a path where I wanted to retire early and yeah. I didn't want to wait for my retirement accounts to allow me to do that. So, you know, a 401 IRAs. Um, right. And I, and I had heard a lot about people just owning real estate, passive income, right. Build a portfolio of single family homes. And eventually you you just live off of the rent income. Uh, so I, I tried, I got immediately into a duplex it was remote. I'm in Denver and I did this out in Milwaukee. I bought it for $80,000, a duplex. It was pretty distressed. I rehabbed it then I rent and refinanced and wrote that out for three years. But, um, so you did the Burr method. I did the Burr method. It wasn't a successful Burr method. The, uh, the, the cash out refi just didn't, didn't pan out. Um, I ended up having to put so much into the rehab that, it, and, the, the value of the property at the time, I ended up just doing a finance with no cash out. So that was kind of unfortunate, but it cash flowed really well. So uh, by the time I sold it, actually uh, two months ago, three months ago, uh, I made 35% returns, annual average returns. So it was good. I sold it for 170. You know, it's crazy. You know, I'm in real estate up here in North Idaho, and I just think it's funny when you say $80,000 for a duplex. Because I've seen duplexes up here in the 400, 500 range and then, and they're dumps. Yeah. Yeah. So just to hear 80,000 and you still weren't able to cash out the, you know, on the refi, but, and I guess for people kind of take a step back for people who don't know what the bird method is, that's buying, renovating, uh, what is it? Rent, renovating. Yeah. Um, buying renting and refinance. Rehab rent refinance repeat yeah so the the goal is on the on the refinance side you get a cash out refinance and hopefully you get a huge enough cash out that you turn around and you use that as a down payment for your next one so you kind of get the snowball started and, and there's been a lot of people who've been successful at it right if you if you target the right the right property you really understand your costs going in and you understand the sale price or the value on the way out, um, right? You can build a portfolio pretty fast. That does not happen with me, um, but I mean, the silver lining is it wasn't a failure. I, I still had a property that was cash flowing, right? But you you recognized it was a slow process, right? It wasn't something that you know it's it's hard to scale it unless you have a lot of properties. True. So yeah, you hit the nail on the head. After that, so if you listen to Bigger Pockets, that's kind of where I got my initial start on. Oh, well, this is kind of how you do it. And then you go look at other resources. But bigger pockets had had kind of classically said if you're getting two hundred to three hundred dollars of profit per month per unit, you're doing well. Like the average is two hundred dollars per unit. Um, but if you do the math on that, I mean two hundred dollars a month in your pockets kind of cool because you're like, well, that that paid for some groceries or paid some utilities. But if you need to offset your active income and you start doing the math of how much, how many units you have to procure to get there, 
it's a long road. Like I needed 50 units to be okay with the income that I would uh, settle with if I got 50 units. Right. It was, mm -hmm. And it's, and from there I would be full time doing it and maybe ramp it and scale it to a hundred units or something. But that road is long and arduous, takes a lot of capital and a ton of work. So from there, I was like, I got to find something different. And I uh, actually on bigger pockets, I came across another um, another podcast of a person talking about syndications, and it, uh, they advertised it as the quickest, the most efficient path to financial freedom. So, commercial real estate, I I pivoted and and ran that direction. Okay, and so where did you start learning about some of this stuff? Because I think when you know when people we've all heard the grant cardones and the people out there talking about invest in multifamily real estate, you know, commercial yep. multifamily. Um, but sometimes it just feels like it's super far away. So how did you, like, where did you start learning about this to where you were like, you know what, this is attainable for me at the position I'm in right now. Yeah. So to put it bluntly, to get in as a passive investor, it's $50,000. So back to the buying a single family home, I could purchase an $80,000 property with a $50,000 down payment, but it's a highly distressed property in a, in a lower income city. Um, if for those of you out there who are looking at single family homes and you're like you and I in Denver and Idaho, and it's just more expensive, it becomes, it starts to become, uh, unattainable when you only have say $50,000 and you want to go buy a single family home. Mm -hmm. So what's cool is on the, the passive investing side, there's a group of general partners like myself that go out and procure a commercial property. We do all the work. We are the sweat equity partners. It takes a ton of effort. There's a team of us that, that finds the property, acquires it, gets the insurance. We find in the, the investors to buy in. And then we run the, the property for the entire business strategy, which typically lasts about five years. We essentially flip an apartment building with tenants still living in it. Um, and when and you the, say you flip it, are you guys bringing cap rates up? Are you, are you basically trying to improve the property to the point where you're increasing rents and things to make the property more valuable and then yes. resell it? Yes. So that's the best part is commercial property uh, different from home prices, which is a comparable, right? What did your yeah. neighbor sell the house for? Right. With commercial properties, it's a revenue generating machine. And the value of the property is directly correlated to, or the, the value of the property is directly correlated to the net operating income of the property. So the revenue. So instead um, of basing your investment off of speculation or where markets might go, you're just strictly looking at what does this produce as, as cash flow and investment and then yep. flip it over to somebody who wants to purchase. Yeah. So okay. we we renovate the the apartments. We'll go in and say a hundred unit apartment complex. We'll we'll take down ten units at a time as leases expire, and then we can do uh, economies of scale. Bring a general contractor in, refresh those units. You know, take them from a classic '80s build to a modern build. And once we put new tenants in there, we can bump the rents two hundred dollars a piece per month right mm -hmm. and then uh over time you renovate enough of it and your your revenue is skyrocketing typically with older properties you can get a a, a reduction in expenses because you can put led lighting in you can put water efficiency in so your expenses come down your your income goes up and all of a sudden your property value skyrockets and that's when you turn around and sell it again and that's where the big gains are for for the the investors and us, right? We we make money doing it, obviously, as well. So, how did you learn how to do this, though? Because it, in a relatively short period of time, you were able to go from single family residential into commercial, and now you're you're with a group of investors, basically going after massive apartment buildings. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So how did you get started with, you know, how did you actually get into that and start learning the, the whole thing? So, yeah, there, there's two paths. There's one if the the general partnership side, the sweat equity side, which is what I did. That's that's a little bit longer um, from, let's say, from a passive investor standpoint. Let's let's rewind the tape a little bit just to talk through the logistics of what we do. 
we buy an apartment building similar to a single family home we where we go get a lender whether mm -hmm. it's a freddie or fanny institutional loan or we go get a bank or a private lender um, but they essentially give us a, a 70 to 80 percent loan to value similar to your home mortgage and then for the down payment, that's where we bring investors in. But when you buy a $20 million apartment complex, 20% is a big number. So that's why we bring a whole bunch of people in, $50,000 minimum payment. Um, and the investor is kind of our, the financial force behind it. And so that in a nutshell is a limited partner. Learning how to understand investing in one of these properties is all about one, it's good to get educated. There's a bunch of books out there. There's a whole bunch of podcasts. To be honest, we could name off a whole bunch, but that's really where I got started. It depends on how you want to learn. I learned via podcasts and then I switched over to books and then I started going to conferences. Uh, and I, I took some formal courses to actually learn how to be an active partner. How do I actually execute one of these plans? And then I go find partners with complementary skills. So that's kind of both paths, but I would say from a passive investor standpoint, educate yourself, understand from a high level what we do, and then find a group like myself who you can um, establish a relationship with. You want to know, like, and trust yeah. the operators because the operators are the ones that are going to make it um, succeed. Yeah. I mean, and if you're going to drop 50K on with somebody, you're, you're not really you know, sure of that's probably pretty risky. Yeah. And, yeah. And speaking about risk, I mean, what is your opinion? Is this a safer way to invest capital and earn, you know, earn returns than it is investing in single family residential? Yes. Um, I, I absolutely think it is because when I have a hundred unit apartment complex and I have one person move out, my occupancy just went to 99% versus a house that person moves out. And if they're out for a month, I mean, you're out one twelfth of uh, your income for the year, right? Because mm -hmm. it's either on or off. And so you, you, you spread out your, your income a little bit more. The other thing is you get economies of scale with the property manager uh, maintenance and all that. So it is, it's more streamlined process and, you have a lot more tenants feeding you revenue. And, did, and you said economies and scale? Economies of scale. Yeah, just with a property manager, uh, especially with like 80 plus units. Yeah. You really just get, you get an on-site property manager. You typically have an on-site maintenance staff. They're just there. I mean, it, right. You you don't want to have a dedicated PM for uh, a 12 unit because you would be paying them full time with only 12 units paying revenue, right? So, right. The more units, the better. Uh, on some of the big properties, you could have a full staff of 16 people. But um, yeah, economies of scale really helps. And then what failures have you had and have you or have you had any failures within this investing realm, especially in commercial side of things? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there, there's two things. I can tell you a story where we completely failed to acquire a property, but I want to put this out there. It, once again, you got to know, like, and trust your operators because it's not if something happens, it's when something happens. For all those yeah. who, who know about owning a home, there's always something that happens, whether it's a pipe breaks or a tenant goes rogue. Um, but from the operator side, uh, actually it was my first apartment complex. I tried to syndicate. It was a 23 unit. I was working with a few other guys. Um, we did all the due diligence inspections. We were getting lending in place, insurance in place. We were getting all the quotes we needed, putting the business plan together. And then we were starting to pump it out there to investors. Hey, look at this. We're going to give you, we're going to double your money in five years. This is our business plan. What ended up happening was uh, a series of events that, uh, ended up forcing us to back out. The seller wasn't working very well with us. We were struggling with the lender as well. Um, and then from an investment standpoint, investors, we weren't getting the investors quick enough. So we had to back out of the deal um, 
before we lost too much money. At the end of the day, we made the, the smart decision. It, no investors were harmed in the situation. We were harmed. We lost money. We always we always choose to lose money ourselves before the investors are harmed. Right. Um, investors are number one and tenants are number two. So that that's kind of my my personal failure story. So I'm curious because the you know the typical everyday person who maybe they make eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Saving up fifty grand is a lot of money. True. Um, and fifty is the the minimum, right? They can invest more. Yes, true. Um, I guess what are the typical returns for somebody who invests fifty thousand? And I know this is kind of a crystal ball question because there's variables, right? Yeah, but if we could break down what returns like that look like, I think that yeah. would help people. Understand. This is simple, to be honest. Um, whenever we put an offering out there for investors, we we straight up lay out what the projected returns are. And that's based on conservative underwriting. We have a business model, a full spreadsheet um, that that lays out a pro forma for five years on our expected business plan. And that also lays out the expected cash flows and returns for all the investors. Um, like I said, because it is a business plan, we target typically double your money in five years, which also equates to roughly a 15% internal rate of return or like a 15 to 20% average annual return. Uh, we, we do not go into a deal without hitting that as our minimum okay. so just think of like a 15 to 20 percent average annual return no matter what we try to do um now in the last three to four years things have been so good with the economy and the interest rates were low we a majority of people were outperforming and they were doubling your money in three years which means your average annual return ended up being about 35 percent i know when a lot of people hear these big numbers because you're on average, the stock market they say is gives you seven eight percent over the the long haul. And right, we are on the regular doing fifteen plus. So, um, it it feels a little scary going into something like that, and a lot of people feel like it's untrue. But uh, the business strategy is there, the economics work, because just like a house flip, you you go in there and you target this is. This is what we're going to sell for in five years. Right. And with very conservative underwriting, we hope to outperform. Well, and I can see how this could be more of a sure thing, right? I mean, nothing's a sure thing, but you can calculate what you're going to sell it for based on pure numbers, where with yep. residential, it's a lot of speculation, right? You want to, you're judging... Correct where the market's headed, where it's currently at. And it's really hard to time markets. And as you can tell, I'm sure even Colorado, it's like things go up and down all the time. And right now, you know, we were just in a bull market and now we're starting to turn over. Yeah. And um, do, does stuff like that affect this multifamily market or investing? To be honest, it, it affects, uh, it has affected us as, as, capital raisers bringing investors in because when the stock market is doing what it's doing investors get very conservative they they pull back and they sit on the money mm -hmm. um what's actually happening in real estate because real estate is doesn't chase the stock market real estate's doing its thing there is a massive supply problem in real estate right now there's a reason housing prices keep going up is because there's something like a three and a half million unit um, uh, demand that the supply can't meet. Right. Three and a half million units. That's going to take the, I saw somewhere in an article that it's going to take up to 10 years for the supply to meet the demand. So when it comes to you're investing in a apartment building, that demand is not going to allow the rent prices to drop, which would subsequently drop the value of your apartment building because the demand is too high. Now, if we look back at 2008, that's very fresh in everybody's eyes. 2008, there was an oversupply of, of homes mm -hmm. and the banks were not being conservative with their underwriting and just, you know, that's, that's the reason they're just willy nilly giving money away. 
Right. This is very different. Like I said, three and a half million dollars behind demand, but also the banks are still being very conservative because of 2008. So we are seeing a lot of stability going on. Um, single family homes to commercial homes. We'll compare that really quick. Single family homes, because the interest rates are going up, you're going to see a little bit of a softening in the, the price increase right? because buyers are now having a little bit more leverage over sellers. But that's yeah. just the softening. It's going to plateau a little bit for a little while, but they're not anticipating it dropping once again because of the supply problem. Likewise, with uh, commercial real estate, we're seeing that us as buyers have a little bit more negotiation power to purchase at a slightly lower price, but the prices aren't dropping as, as they would in a bubble. It's just kind of a, the curve is softening as far as price increase year over year. And how do you guys find these deals? Like, um, you, you know, when you're talking about hundred unit, hundred units, I mean, that's a big apartment complex and I'm sure you guys have had, I think you just said you guys got another one recently with like, we 200. just closed. Yeah. 248 units closed yesterday. And then last week we had another 350 unit close in Houston and that's we're expecting lot. another 250 ish closing, uh, by the end of the month yeah so that's quite yeah a bit. it's like it's like a total of 750 units that are closing in one month and i guess so uh, there's maybe a two-part question how do you find these deals and then what class are these are these a you know a plus properties oh, all over these? yeah so this is fun this is as a passive investor it's uh you, you kind of start to learn the the class of apartment and how and, and which ones you start liking and which locations and which operator and what their business strategy is, because it all depends. So just to define it, a class A is like your, your fancy new apartment buildings with swimming pools and all sorts of the amenities. Mm -hmm. um, they're typically built uh, in the mid aughts. So uh, call it 2002 and forward, I guess is um, class B is the step down from that. You may not have all the amenities, likely not a pool, but it's still a nice, nice more modern-ish apartment and then the class c is your your dated your old it's like a 1980s vintage and it, it needs some help so and what we usually do based on area too right like location and yeah and location and, yep yep absolutely right so what um there's the value adds well they're all essentially value add strategy but in a different way um like i said the flip value add where we take in the 80s that's actually Two of the properties, two of the 250 unit properties closing this month are both um, C plus, B minus, and and uh, how nice they are. Just uh, what needs upgraded in in their age. Uh, but what we do is take like that C plus property, renovate it, and we turn it into a solid B. Mm -hmm. And so from there, we we raise rents, we get a different clientele turn and and all of a sudden we we now have a totally different property than it used to be right um the value add scenario in a class a that's the 350 unit that closed last week that one we bought off of the developer and this is kind of a fun strategy because this is a resort style property we kind of called it our flagship property uh it's beautiful developers they don't want to keep their property the way they need to get out of the property though is they can't sell an empty property they can't just build it and sell it to someone empty and vacant because it's not making revenue it's not worth anything so it's hard so, to base their it's hard to base a price off of that right There's yeah no you can't rate. base a price off of something that's not getting revenue so what they do is they they try to get 350 tenants in there as quickly as possible so first and last month's rent here's a free garage you know um all these amenities are free. So as soon as we take over, right, they fill it as fast as possible. They get it up to about 90% occupancy and then they put it on the market. We come in and say, cool, there's, there's still meat on the bone there to increase the revenue because the second we take over, there's no more concessions of first and last month's rent. We start charging X amount of dollars for the garage and all the other amenities so we get a huge plus up in revenue right out of the gate and we have a beautiful property that's cash flowing really nicely do you guys have a lot of competition with big investors because there's a even in commercial space there's a lot of people aren't there there's a lot of investors trying to buy up apartment buildings yes um, 
I know you guys are probably up against a lot of these guys that have been doing it a long time. What does that look like? Yeah, I, yeah, we absolutely um, fight against big institutions and family offices and stuff that that go after these. And really, the the only way I'm not an acquisitions guy, but I can talk about it because right, I, I'm part of the GP group. But um, we go befriend brokers, commercial brokers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at some point you develop a lot of trust with them. They, they, they got to know, like, and trust you. And then they start sending you good deals. There is off market deals that happen. Um, or you just end up in, in a battle with whoever else is bidding. So just to give you metrics on average, most groups will underwrite say a hundred to 150 properties out of, out of all those, they might put offers in on 15 of them. And out of all that, they may win one. So it's kind of a numbers game. Sometimes they come through off market. They're just like, hey, we just closed on an apartment complex a block away. That broker says, hey, this one, this seller wants to sell. I know that you can close, right? They know, like, and trust us. They know that we can turn around and close quickly. This seller wants it. Like they're doing a 1031 exchange and they're on a timeline. So here you go, make them an offer. Right. So a lot of that stuff happens. Hmm. Um. How do you now you you mentioned you're not an acquisition guy. So do you guys all in your partner group, do you guys all have different roles? And what are the yes. what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, like I said, there there's a reason there's a team effort because there's so much work to do. Um for me, I am I, I actually ended up switching into a capital raiser, uh primarily capital raiser. I didn't expect that. I'm an engineer. I I should be running numbers on the, on the underwriting model, <laughs> but, um, on the, on the back end, I do asset management as well. There's actually sec regulations just to take a step back. We are heavily regulated by the securities and exchange commission. And part of the rules is you cannot just be a capital raiser. You have to be providing some other form of sweat equity and some of that could be the acquisitions guy. You could be a full-time underwriter. You could be um, the guy who does the the lending expertise, right? Asset management, right? And there's what do you a think that is? There. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Just wondering why, like, why it couldn't? Because there could just be people who are really good at raising capital. Yeah, why they couldn't do that, but um. Is that hard? I mean, that's probably more of a sales role, right? You're you're it selling is, people yeah. on why they need to invest with you and and why you're a good choice. Yeah, I, it's totally a sales role, sales and marketing. And me coming out of a engineering and program management, I'm I've been teaching myself how to do it. And I, to be honest, I think I'm I've been successful thus far. I think because I suck as a sales guy and a marketing guy because mm-hmm. I I I relate more to people. Right. right. And I, I don't, I, I don't use used car salesmen or anything. Right. I'm just like, let me just educate. That's really all it is. Yeah. The sales piece is just educating and making people feel comfortable. Right. And I think there's something to be said about that too, because I've, I know plenty of people who are that, you know, I have friends that are used, actually used car salesmen, but just using that term, um, there's some people who have that like kind of sneaky personality that's like, yeah, you just don't know if you can trust them or not, right? They're just right. selling you on stuff all the time. Uh, so just being real with people, I think, is going to help in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when when uh, with your company Vestas Capital, you founded it. Is this, or is your company the one that you guys all partnered in, or do you guys all have separate capital companies, or what? What is that? Yeah, it's so I'm I'm solo in Vestas Capital, and I go partner with a whole bunch of other groups. Okay, so based on my learning from that first property, we all went in as like this, this single, Hey, let's, let's do this together. And it, it kind of fell apart. Um, I branched out from there and I went and found a very experienced group because I wanted mm-hmm. to bring my personal investors to a solid deal that had a, um, a group that had a long track record and that worked. And I was like, Oh, well, let's do that some more. And so through a ton of networking, I mean, The first group that I successfully invested with, I had been talking with those guys for a year and watched what they did. So I don't take bringing investors lightly. Um, 
to to deals and groups i i vet them and and look at their history and it's, it actually helps because investors want to walk into something with a lot of solid history where do you find then, your investors are they i'm sorry yeah you... no go ahead uh where do you find your investors are they just people that you you market to or are they people that you you know like how does that work everywhere you yeah. everyone who gets into the active side starts with friends and family mm -hmm. um and then you branch off you go to meetups you go to um networking events um linkedin so there's also advertisements when you get a deal you can advertise some deals you can't we can talk about that really quick accredited versus non-accredited investors we're, we're taking a tangent really quick yeah uh a 506b deal allows the person who may make a hundred thousand dollars a year they are not accredited accredited means you make two hundred thousand a year or you have a net worth of a million dollars excluding your home you can't use your home's equity to to calculate your net worth so if you're non-accredited um you have to d establish a relationship with us we are not allowed to advertise which there's a lot of deals that happen behind the scenes because you never see it advertised. Those are 506B deals. You establish a relationship with me. We, we remain above the law in the SEC's eyes. Only people in my network get to see the deal on those um, 506B deals. On the 506C with accredited investors, we can go gangbusters. I can put up billboards on the highway if I wanted to or pump the internet. And so that's I, I, I do a mixture of both and I'll do paid advertisements on those 506C deals. So I get investors that way too. So those 506B deals with non-accredited investors, you can't advertise at all. You can't like, correct. so how, I don't want to name drop, but there's, no, I won't. There's like the big investors that I've mentioned earlier in the show Grand that do multifamily. So how are yep. they doing it? Because they're bringing in non-accredited investors and they're running through social media. They're putting posts out. They... Okay. I, yeah, I, I watched Grant Cardone. I have never dug into how he's doing races and all that. Yeah. Um, there, they could, there's a path to doing advertising and bringing in non-accredited through crowdfunding. Okay. I think it's like 506 CF crowdfunding. I've reached the limits of my knowledge but I know some others that are doing such. And when you get to a crowdfunding model, uh, they start saying, well, hey, the minimum investment is $1,000. Mm -hmm. However, crowd funds typically take a share off the top, they become middlemen, and then you do not have direct access to the people actually operating the deal. You're just throwing money, um, like crowdsource.com, I think is one of it. Anyway, you, you go in there and you just throw your money at a deal and right. you just get updates, right? You just, it, you don't have any access to talk to, hey, Flint, what's going on? How's the property going, right? So to when you're actually investing, to, when you're yeah. actually investing outside of a crowd fund, you have that access to the yeah. operating group. Okay. Yep. Well, we're getting kind of close to the end of the show. Is there any, uh, do you have any final thoughts or tips for people who are thinking about diving into, or let's just say this, for people who want to invest in real estate, but don't feel like they can do it. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, okay, so there's the, they may not have $50,000 to invest. You'd actually be surprised if you have $50,000 to invest. If you have an old job and a 401k that you haven't rolled into your new one, mm -hmm. you can invest your 401k money through a solo 401k. You can also do self-directed IRAs, which basically give you checkbook control to invest uh, in properties as well. So if you want to get, if your IRA just took a big hit over the last three months, you're like, Jesus, just let's get it into a tangible, stable, high return asset. You can make that happen with those self-directed accounts. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah. I think, uh, if anybody has direct questions for you, then you should, they should probably go to vestuscapital.com, right? Yeah. I have a Calendly link and I find out it, to be honest, just just go to the Calendly and schedule 15 minutes with me because sometimes the best way to learn is to to talk to one of us, right. whether it's me or any of my peers, because we can actually give you a guided um, maybe education where you need to go based on what your current knowledge is. We can point you in the right direction. So for... if they're not ready right now, you can kind of help them along the path to get them 
get them going towards where yeah and whether they like this is a good podcast for you or this is a good book for you to read or and just get on our database and get in our email list because you will see the offerings come through both 506c and b and you can learn from that because we put an entire pitch deck together to teach you about the deal before you even jump in awesome well i think it's exciting it's uh definitely got my wheels turning on you know after we first started talking about doing a, a podcast yeah um just because it's one of those things that we've wanted to invest in commercial family real estate but even myself right i'm in the business and it just still feels like it's such a big leap sometimes yeah. to do that and part of that is just my lack of knowledge around it right my yep i'm i'm a little naive when it comes to the commercial family side of things where i'm much more familiar with single family residential because i'm in it all the time yep so, talk so let me put like- this yeah, let me put it this way. I I moved very slowly. I I took a year to educate myself before I was comfortable um, being a passive investor. And then once I was ready, I invested in two back-to-back deals a month apart. Um, and those deals are just killing it right now. And then I, I went active from there. So uh, whether you want to go active or not, a lot of people get in on the passive side just to learn the passive side. And to be honest, you don't need to take a year. I didn't reach out to anyone. I was trying to be self-taught the whole way through and understand too much all at once. You don't need to do that. Take one step at a time. Talk to someone. Maybe you can make your first step in three months. So your big, do you think your biggest growth point was when you started networking with others that had the experience? Yeah, absolutely. And then you go to a conference or something to, to learn more and, and meet up with operators. Cool. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. Um, I hope this is valuable for everybody listening because I know for me, it's it's been exciting just talking about it. So thank you again for coming on. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just remind everybody, the show is released on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, as well as all audio platforms such as Spotify and iTunes. So be sure to subscribe to whichever platform fits you best. And we'll see you on the next one. find what you were looking for? I've got some work to do. Did you find what you were looking for? I've got some work to do.